tell you what's pretty exciting today. I am at tea making level. So I'm sitting on a perching stool. Looks like this. So it's a bit of a mission if you don't have everything here with you when you start. I've just been to the pool. Now, uh, as if being disabled isn't bad enough, you don't need the dramas that go with it. And the pool is having some work done. Now this is fine, but the work encroaches on the disabled ramp. Now it's got a really tight turn at the bottom and you can get around, but when I arrived today, they've boarded it off. Now I don't take my uh, phone into the pool, so I was a bit annoyed and I turned around to go back to the car to call reception and ask them why the ramp was boarded off, I couldn't get in, but the receptionist saw me turn around and leave um, knows me by name and knew that I hadn't actually been into the pool so came out to ask what was wrong and I said well the ramp's been boarded off I can't get in so of course she had a go at the workmen and we got it all sorted but come on guys you, we shouldn't have to do this thank you to that receptionist for being really um onto it and noticing the uh, noticing the problem before I even got to the phone but uh workmen come on guys uh it's not on and then when I got inside, problem solving number two, I had to then figure out how I was going to get, where I was going to go and how I was going to get in because the deep end was busy and the near side deep lane was busy with two or three people. So I was like, hmm, what do we do now? So the shallow end has got disabled steps in it. The disabled steps are no use to me because they've got one handrail and not two. The disabled steps cover the steps cut out into the side of the pool that I would use so I can't get in that side. So I had to ponder over it for a while and get in the other side and put, um, we got in the end, got, got in the shallow end, um, left the wheelchair like way over there and got in a lane and it all worked out in the end. But you know, it's just like, why can't life just be straightforward for a change? Then I did my 2,000 meters and I'm now starting to feel a little bit more like the old me. And uh, the 2,000 meters was slightly faster than yesterday. One of the big problems I have had after I started wearing the leg is figuring out how to get in and out of the car without looking like a complete numpty. Now, the first few times I just could not sort out how to do it and it's taken me a good few weeks to figure this out. What I can't do is I can't bend the ankle or point the toe or twist my foot. I also am not allowed to do this either because that rotates the leg in the socket and gives me problems. So my knee has got to stay pointing forward. So I can't do any of this very easily. So how the hell do you get into a car? Well, I think I've sorted out the getting in, but I haven't quite sorted out the getting out. Let me show you how I'm doing it at the moment. So what I've got to do is put this leg in as far over and as far up into the footwell as I can so that my knee will clear the steering wheel when I get in. If I don't get my foot in the right place to start with, we're screwed. So it sort of looks like this. So we go in and up and sit down. Now that, now I've figured it out, looks reasonably straightforward. But the problem now is if I rotate my leg to get out, my foot goes underneath the brake pedal and I can't feel if it's there till I wrench the leg off. So my getting out is not quite as smooth as my getting in. If anybody's got any tips for this, please let me know. So here's how I'm doing it. So I turn my whole leg, I've got to make sure the foot doesn't get jammed under the brake pedal and then up I get with just my right leg. Now I tell you what, that is considerably better than it used to be. But my getting out is still not really that smooth. I need to improve it. I can get in and almost look normal. But when I was going to the alter alterations place to pick up my trousers, he could see me struggling to get out of the car and offered to come out and bring them to me. So I need to practice that some more to make it better. But trust me, I wish I'd have videoed it at the beginning because it's a million times better already. All these problems you don't even think of when you're not an amputee. 
wheelchair problem solving. Now I'm on a mini mission to try and minimize the amount of times I need the wheelchair and maximize the amount of times I'm standing up either on two feet or one on crutches. Um, I, it is a real mental thing to try and go out without the wheelchair because it's sort of become the thing that I think I need and I'm trying to transition away from needing the wheelchair to needing the leg instead. So I come into work and I bring all this equipment with me, the wheelchair, the crutches, the leg, and all the bits and bobs that go with it. And I'm trying to re reduce this. So we've cut it down to the following things that I use the wheelchair for inside work. And that is to carry hot drinks and food around that I can't otherwise carry in my hands and to move the laundry to the laundry uh, cupboard when I've done a massage. Now I was problem solving this with a number of people and here is what they've come up with. Now this was started off my sister's idea. Uh, so thank you Samantha. And here is what I, she came up with. She said a bag. So we've got this bag here and it's supposed to be a beach bag but it's got big rope handles and what I can do is hang that off the crutch handle. Now the laundry is not going to be much, it's just going to be one massage uh, linen change and it's also um, not going to be heavy either. And so I can carry on that, on the crutch handles from the massage room to the laundry. And I've just tried it now, taking the, the linen from the laundry back to the massage room and it worked quite nicely. So thank you Samantha for that. We've minimized one reason why I need the wheelchair. There's just one left and that is carrying coffee. Now. Gemma, one of my staff, and a client of hers were problem solving this last night for me too. Uh, now there's nothing, no use in hanging it around my neck because it will splash and I'll wear it before I get to where I'm going. I've got a cup that's got a sealed top but it's still not watertight. Um, and last night, this uh, client that, uh, that was talking about this suggested the following. Now, you know the, um, the ball which uh, you sit in and it binds you in all different directions but you swing around inside, but you always stay upright. We need one of them. We need one of them for a coffee cup that I can hang around my neck, that the coffee cup stays upright, even if it's swinging. Now, apparently, according to Gemma, who's got children, Tommy Tippy do that sort of thing with bowls for small children so it doesn't spill. Does somebody do it for coffee cups? If anybody has any bright ideas about that, let me know, because it's the only thing that I still can't carry on crutches, and I would love to uh, be able to Eliminate that from the problem solving list. Now, coming to the question, what is it like to walk on a prosthetic? Now, there's two elements to this question. I have been asked this question more times than any other question. So I'm going to try to explain. Uh, the second part of the question was what does it is it like from a brain point of view? What is my brain telling me should be happening or not happening? So I'm going to try and cover off both of those things. So how do you walk on a prosthetic? Now, firstly, what does it feel like? That's the most common question I get asked. Now, if you look at the leg, I'll roll it up. The socket is below the knee and it comes down below my kneecap, up at the sides and cuts around at the back of my knee. I'll show you later what that looks like without the sleeve on. So when I put pressure on it, if you imagine, if you get someone to grab your leg front and back, just below the knee and squeeze each time I put my foot on the floor, my not foot, that's what it feels like. Squeeze pressure below the knee. The end of the bone does not come in contact with anything. And if the socket gets too big and the end of the bone does bottom out, as they might call it, then I'm in trouble. So when my leg shrinks, I have to put lots and lots of layers of socks on underneath to keep the socket the right size. I'll show you what they look like later. So, how do I actually walk? Well, because a, le a leg is a bone, if you like make your hand into a cone shape, put your finger in the middle, that is your bone and it needs to be nice and tight, so grip your finger tight, 
that's what the socket needs to be like. So if you move your finger backwards and forwards to imitate a knee bend, the bone needs to stay still. If you loosen that finger a little bit and then move your finger back, loosen and move your finger backwards and forwards, you'll see what happens. The bottom of the bone pushes out on the front of the socket and the back of the socket. Now that is going to cause problems and it could actually break through and cause a wound and all sorts of things and we don't want that. So that's why the socket needs to stay tight. It also means my knee has to do something different to the other side because if I don't walk with a leg with a straight knee, when I put the heel on the floor, I have to put my heel on the floor and knee straight. Then the bone behaves in the correct way inside the socket. If I've got the knee bent slightly, the bone, if you imagine your finger in the socket, your bone goes off center slightly and pressure gets put in the wrong place. So I'm heel and then the crutches go with my prosthetic leg. So the crutches go down, I come over the top, my leg is locked out and then I step off and step through. Now the foot at the back, it bends, the toes bend on that foot very slightly, but only under pressure. They don't, I can't leverage off them. So when I get to this point here, the only way that I can lift my foot up off the floor now is if you imagine you're standing still and you push your foot back like you're trying to push the wall, that is what it's like for me. So when I get to here, because I don't have an ankle, if you imagine going up onto your tippy toes, that's how you do the last part of your step in a walk. But I haven't got an ankle or a foot and my calf muscle has been put in a different place. So nothing is working down there. So what I have to do then, so I've gone straight leg, crutches go with me. Hang on, I'll do it the other way around so you can see the leg. So straight leg, crutches go with, go with the leg. And then I come through, knee stays locked, and I step. There's about 60% of my weight going through the crutches and 30 to 40 through the leg. We're hoping to increase the leg and decrease the crutches, but it's a bit too early for that just yet. Then when I get to here, I can make that toe bend back there, but I can't lift it. So what I have to do at this point is that. So my hamstring and glute is what's lifting that leg and I have to imagine I'm doing that. Now if I don't, I'll drag the toe and there's only one way I'm going to know that and that's if I feel the vibration further up my leg because remember this is not my foot. So I've got to make sure when I get to here that my knee and my hamstring is engaged enough so I've got the foot high enough up at the back to bring the knee through and then step. Straight leg, crutches and then step. Now, what that looks like when you put them together, my left leg is actually doing something completely different to my right leg because there's no calf. So in my left leg, my hamstring and my glute is working all the time in place of the calf muscle. But once I've mastered this, you will never know the difference. Now, bearing that in mind, I'm just gonna go back there and come back again and I'll show you what that looks like. So, straight leg out, crutches, hamstring bend, straight leg out, crutches, hamstring bend. That's what I'm doing the whole time. So if I come close, come forward to you, and I'll just walk normally, and I'm aiming for my weight to be central, my steps to be the same size, like so. Hopefully that looks reasonably even going backwards. That's another trick. <laughs> now, when it comes to bending my knee, so if I'll step back a little bit more, when it comes to bending my knee in different directions like this, I have got to be really careful because if I want to change direction from here, I cannot turn and leave the foot where it is because the leg is not part of me. So the foot will stay there, the leg will stay there, and my bone will rotate inside the socket. And that will give me problems. So I have never got to, I've got to make sure I never turn and leave the foot where it is. I've got to go with the foot first, if that makes sense. Now, what is it doing from a brain point of view? Well, that has been the strangest part of all because for seven weeks, I have been 
on one leg and I've been leaning over. You've seen how far I've had to lean over in order to stay balanced on that one leg. Now they've put me on another leg. My balance has got to go from here back over to the middle again, which feels really strange because I'm standing on one foot and on the other leg, I've got that knee squeeze. And that's what's happening both at the same time. But I've got to get used to standing back in the center but I've got to be able to balance both ways because if I'm not wearing the leg, I need to be over here. If I am wearing the leg, I need to be over here. I've also got to remember there's a foot or not a foot. And that's another strange thing. Now, from a brain point of view, I don't know where the foot is. I can feel the vibration when I do that come up through my leg and I can feel it up here. Equally, if someone was to stand on the toe or catch my foot under the table or something like that, even though it's not my foot, I can feel it because the socket moves slightly or I feel the vibration further up my leg. So when I was starting to walk, I really had to feel, think about what that feels like when the heel goes down on the floor so that I know what the new sensation is because I'm not getting a sensory sensation from the foot. I'm getting a vibration sensation through the leg instead. Equally, when I drag the toe on the floor, I have got to, I've got to tell my brain to look for the vibration. And it really feels like I'm exaggerating this knee walk like this. But actually, when I walk, I've watched it back. That's why I video myself regularly. That's not actually how it comes out. But I feel like I'm walking with one leg normally and the other leg is doing this in an exaggerated fashion. It feels really strange. But to keep the, the walking even, I've got to tell my brain, hamstring and glute on the left. Hamstring and glute on the left. And as long as I can feel that when I take the back end of the stride, then I know that it looks normal. But what the brain is saying, what is happening down there, are two completely different things. And at the moment, it's a very conscious thought process to make it work properly. It is not natural in the slightest. And I know that I'm making it look relatively easy, but it just isn't. So have a look at what the walking looks like now. Uh, now that you know all of that and tell me what you think. Now I know the weight distribution is not even left and right leg. I am still leaning slightly to the right and that is on purpose because the wound is not completely healed so we're not yet pushing the weight bearing on the left hand side too much. But I'm hoping that the steps are even and the stride is even. So putting the leg on and off. Now the socket shape is done on purpose so that my knee can move without ending up inside the socket but there's support on the side of the knee. Now I'll take it off and I will just show you what that socket looks like. So there we go. So that is the back that comes up behind my knee. This is the front. My kneecap sits in there and this is sits on the sides of my knee joint. The bottom of the socket just looks like that and nothing should touch that. Now to keep the leg the right size, I have to wear a liner like this. And this is the gel liner I've spoken about before. And then inside that, we have got some other fleecy liners. Now these are like that. And I've currently got two of them on. And that is because my leg has shrunk since they made the prosthetic. So I've got to keep adding layers until we have got three or four and then they make me a new socket and away we go again. So that's how it works. And it's all a bit high maintenance. Now you've got to remember all of the stuff you need for putting a leg on and off. And when I have to leave it off, that's why I wear these shorter trousers because it makes it easier. And then there's a whole lot of stuff that I sort of stack in it and it sits in the corner um, for a while uh, whilst I have a rest. Eventually, I will be able to wear it 13, 14 hours a day and it won't be a problem. But we need to build up gradually because the tissue on the end of this le left leg 
is not used to having that sort of pressure and is not used to being load bearing. So we need to build it up gradually. Otherwise, I'm going to end up with blisters, skin breakdown and that sort of thing. And that is a bad thing. So that's the potted guide to wearing our prosthetic. If I missed anything out that you're dying to know the answer to, please do ask away. I'm more than happy to cover anything off. I think this, this socket will probably last me till maybe the early to mid-jan and then I'll be getting a new one. Hopefully, as long as the post has not held up too much, I'm hoping the next socket will have union jacks on it, but we'll see. And I'm also gonna ask if I can keep them all so we can have like a history of the leg. Anyway, thank you for listening. Thank you for the question. And I will talk to you again soon.